and um, connections is that Jack Matloff uh, was a dear, dear colleague of mine, and uh, I still he is still a dear colleague of mine, and always was a, a mensch and, and helped me in my um, when I first became uh, came to Cedar Sinai and one of the true gentlemen and great doctors um, of the world. So anyway, please give my regards to your whole family and thanks for what you're doing. Um, there's there, there's risks in, in trying to introduce Michael Berimov because for most people um, who are involved in the Jewish communal life, especially in Los Angeles, or anybody who's ever picked up the Jewish Journal or um, seen a Holocaust-related movie, um, it's hard not to know who Michael Berimov is. So he, in some ways, is the cliche um, is of a person who needs no introduction in a Jewish community of involved people. It's Michael Berimam. The other risk is that by trying to do a formal introduction, I won't do him justice because this is, as I said, one of the true great um, Jews of, of the world in the world. Um, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. When I was first appointed to the museum, I didn't know a whole lot about it, and I called Michael. I met him a few times, and I was proud to tell this story. And I said, Michael, can we? Um, I, I want to know the lay of land. I want to know what you know what I'm doing here, so I can make a positive contribution. And Michael and I met at Pat's, and became what became a series of, of lunches with friends. And I truly always felt that I was being honored in the presence of one of the most brilliant and sincere uh, people I've ever met in the world. So Michael, you know how I feel about you. I told you that in public and in private. You can clap because. <laughs> Michael for something and he'll be there to do it. Um, he, his formal position right now, he's the director of the Ziggy, uh, Ziggy Zeering Institute at the AJU, where he's also a professor of, Jew, of Jewish studies. He writes regularly for the, for the uh, Jewish Journal. He's published scores of articles and books, and uh, as I said, you only have to pick up a newspaper to, to uh, the Jewish newspaper to see one of his scholarly articles. And they're always brilliant to read. Um, at the professional level, in the world of Holocaust commemoration, there's no larger giant than Michael, who was the project director for the U.S. Holocaust Museum. Since its inception and opening, the museum has had about, has had almost, well over 30 million visitors. I believe it's the second most visited uh, museum in Washington. It's become a place of pilgrimage. And uh, even when Yad Vashem redid their exhibit uh, a few years ago, um, they <coughs> In some ways, I think stole some of Michael's ideas, and of course, I consider it sharing because we're all big. We're all big one community, but it's truly an honor um, that we had him as our to tell us guide us through the formation of the museum. Um, another incredible thing for somebody who's not really busy is Michael was the executive editor of the second edition of the Cyclopedia Judaica. Um, it was first published in 1972, and the second edition was published. It has 22 volumes and 16 million words and 25,000 contributions. I imagine that the editor had to read all of those. Um, I don't know if I've read 22 volumes, 16 million words, and 25,000 contributions in my whole life, let alone in publishing a work. Um, Michael's also been a producer of, a, of, of movies, including one that won an Academy Award. And uh, I could go on and on, but uh, I, I'm only here to be introduced to Michael Birabam, So. Michael. After such an introduction, I think I have the opportunity to refute it. <laughs> um, the other thing is you have to be a little bit careful because I just had um, what is a speaker's uh, delight, which is that I just gave a mini seminar in which my first day of speaking was seven hours, and then the fellow who followed me uh, pulled his back, so I had another eight hours. <laughs> so I've just had 15 hours of speaking in two days, and obviously you don't want me to speak for 15 hours. Look, um, and it, it's an honor also to be with uh, Honey, uh, who is absolutely wonderful and cherished and um, embodies all of the wonderful values that uh, I regard as sacred. And to speak to my good friend David Suisa. Let me say I represent no one, and um, representing no one means that I'm not, uh, I have distinct political views, they are uniquely my own, and I'm going to represent
transcend some of them for a moment and talk about the election in a larger context and in the way in which we see it do so briefly. Let me begin by saying a couple of things. The United States was in a catastrophic situation four years ago. Our basic institutions had failed, the banking system was going down, and the economy had tanked. Anybody coming in in those circumstances would have had a difficult time, and anybody who came coming in in that circumstances who was able to keep the nation afloat did a remarkable job. If you ask the basic question, are we better off now than we were four years ago, the answer is yes. Are we well off? Not yet. And that's the basic criteria that which we have to go. Let me talk for a moment about the social agenda because the social agenda is, to my mind, very interesting and there are deep and profound Jewish values on the social agenda. Let me, um, and then I want to talk about the Middle East in a, uh, in a very distinct way. Several issues on the social agenda. Judaism as a religion um, does not believe that life begins at, conce at conception. And that has real implications for everything from contraception to stem cell research. And real implications also with regard to the treatments of stem cell research has implications for abortion and has implications for the way in which um, uh, in vitro fertilization uh, is done. The basic rule that has been adopted by a segment of the population comes out of Roman Catholic theology that essentially regards life that has not yet come through the womb, life in vitro, as innocent life, and regards all other life as life tainted by original sin. So if you talk about that, we believe very differently about the origin of life, about the moment in which life is conceived, and about the implications of that for health care and for everything else. That's not to argue pro or anti-abortion. It's merely to say that we deeply and profoundly dissent from that. And in terms of the type of research that can be done and should be done with regard to stem cell, the position of Judaism, right, left, and center, orthodox, conservative, and reform, dramatically different. The second thing I'd like to talk about with regard to the social agenda is the notion of self-interest of the Jewish community. Jewish community is a grain Jewish community. If the average, we, our average age is about 13 years older than the average age of the American population. If you change the way in which there is support for programs for the elderly, there will be very little support for the rest of the Jewish agenda of any sort. And consequently, we have a deep self-interest, not only of matter of values and compassion, but a deep self-interest in the nature of the type of positions represented by that. We all know one other thing, and I say this, we all know that essentially over time, the nature of the entitlement programs do not necessarily have to change, but they have to become um, uh, essentially extended. The great fix of Social Security was to move Social Security retirement age up. It was done by uh, an agreement between Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill. It protected Social Security for a long period of time. When Social Security was initiated, the average age of the American population was 52. The average age of the American population is now 17 years longer than that. There is no reason for Social Security to step in that early, and there is no reason for Social Security not to be elongated over a period of time. And that begins to take, that begins to take significantly and dramatically what we call the debt crisis into a different modality. The people best able to move on that are Democrats who are invested in Social Security if they beat the sacred cow. And the idea that we came very close to a grand bargain between John Bonner, uh, John Bonner and, and uh, President Obama and backed away from that is an indication of a deep and profound problem among our political leadership 
who are not prepared to solve problems. My wife worked for Mitch McConnell. I know Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell was a guest at my wedding. Mitch McConnell has been a guest in my home. Mitch McConnell did the single most unpatriotic thing imaginable in the United States, and I've said it to him when he said, my number one political goal is to make Barack Obama a one-term president. And the reason he did, made that as a mistake is in 2009, anybody coming in as president of the United States had to succeed. And they had to succeed not because they were Democrats or because they were Republicans, but because they were Americans. And if they didn't succeed, the nation was going to go off a deep cliff. It came to the edge of that cliff. And the remarkable thing is to see the continuity between Henry Paulson, who took us with the beginning of that, and what followed. We have seen a couple of things. Number one, we have seen an opposition party that has played only the opposition role and not a constructive role. Rewarding that is profoundly dangerous. It also means that if the Democrats go into the opposition, they have no incentive other than to do that. That changes the nature of the United States of America. I lived in Washington for 20 years. We are an intermarriage. My wife was formerly a Republican. Uh, when I brought her home, my mother uh, sat at my uh, oldest son sat at table said, do you know who your son is dating? And my mother looked at me cross-eyed. And he said, uh, Grandma, it's worse than that. <laughs> she looked at me further cross-eyed. And she said, it's worse than that. And then my mother couldn't imagine what would be worse than that after it was a non-Jewish woman and a man. <laughs> the question is, what was worse than that? And my uh, the son said, a Republican, and my mother said, of course. <laughs> the major element is if the Democrats then become an opposition, like it, when we lived in Washington, people essentially could fight during the day, but not afterwards. And there were middle grounds. And there were conversations, there were intense conversations. And those conversations were very important, and America is based on the idea that the political battles are, are fought between the 30 armies. Not in the extreme left and not in the extreme right. If we go in that direction, it's different America. Now, the other thing we have is we have a question of the allocation of resources. How are resources to be allocated? If I'm giving a lecture on the Holocaust, I talk about Superfluous population has been the, 20, the central issue of 20th and 21st century government. And the question is, who is superfluous population? Those who no longer work, those who are not capable of work, and those who do not yet work. We call one social security, the second education, the third, the social safety net. The question becomes, how do we handle that? We should handle that as a community. And we should handle that with government as the backdrop. If we handle it as isolation, as isolated individuals without social structures, we're in deep and significant trouble. And the other thing we have to see is that austerity has failed in the European model, and austerity failed in the Japanese model. If we go with that model, then we are headed to a second type of recession. And it's clear, and I do business in Europe, and I do business in Israel, it's clear if you go to Europe the degree to which the economy is deeply depressed. And it's clear to me, because I face it economically all the time, when the euro has gone down 15 or 18 percent, uh, and I get paid in euros and convert them to dollars, we see the impact of that type of, of, that type of recession. Let's talk about the Middle East, and I'm going to say something that's enormously controversial. I say it in the presence of my good friend, Joel Geiderman, with whom I have a, a deep, profound, and wonderful and loving relationship, but with whom I have significant political differences. And I have significant political differences. Let me say it to you very simply, that with regard to um, uh, American foreign policy, we have a series of serious problems. Contra David Suiza, 
I believe that we have to go, and, and David knows my views on this, we have to go to a two-state solution, not because we like the Arabs, but because we don't want peace with the Arabs, we want a divorce from the Arabs. And I think it is crazy to think of a peace process because there's no evidence whatsoever that uh, peace is, is desired on one party's part, but that doesn't mean you can't divorce. You divorce on very basis because you can't live together. A two-state solution is absolutely <coughs> urgent for Israel because otherwise Israel cannot remain Jewish, democratic, and control the substantive numbers of Arabs who live within its borders. And if you rule between the Jordan and the Mediterranean, then Jews will become, <coughs> in a fairly short order, a minority within their own country, or you will have such a significant Arab presence that if you give them the right to vote, you will not be able to preserve the Jewish character of the state in any way. So the status quo ante, I think, is a catastrophe for Israel. And I think it represents a deep and profound problem. Now let's also say, I think a weak America is catastrophic for Israel as well. And I think one of the outcomes of the last administration, not because George Bush was not a friend of Israel, he was a great friend of Israel, but one of the outcomes of the last administration with difficult decisions of going into Iraq and then going into an Iraq with inadequate power, one of the out and then the economic power that resulted from the economic meltdown, one of the great results of that, one of the unfortunate results, was a profound weakening of America and America's standing. And a weak America is not good for Israel whatsoever. Only a strong America is in that position. And I think America has been strengthened in part not only because we've become stronger, but because the other sides have been uh, weakened in the types of plays that are taking place. Don't have to tell you that Israel's in a dangerous position, and I don't have to tell you that it would be, I would feel far more comfortable, and I've known Bibi Netanyahu since high school, so I know him well. I know him personally, I've known him since high school, I've known all three of his wives, I know, I know his, um, his older daughter, I knew his father, I even read his father's 1500 page book and wrote a long review and edited parts of that before his father published the book. So you're talking about somebody I go back with. Bibi is a brilliant tactician, but I ask you a question, what is his strategy? What does he want to achieve? And if you can't answer the question what you want to achieve, and Bibi has always been a brilliant tactician, the question becomes, what does he want to achieve? And you have to look at the staccato nature of the types of things that have happened here. Last year, around the APEC conference, we were arguing about the question of what type of borders was Israel going to have? Were the borders of 67 going to be the borders upon which a final settlement was to be negotiated? Two months later, he agreed to that after bringing it to the edge. This year, we were operating on the question of Iran. And operating on the question of Iran, what's very interesting is that immediately when Bibi thought he had a political opportunity, which would have taken him to elections before he had the opportunity to bring Kadima into the equation, when he had an opportunity to come for elections, all of a sudden the problem of Iran was delayed by several months, at least until March of 2013 because Bibi could not have undertaken action against Iran while he was running for election. He could not undertake action against Iran in October because if Obama were to be reelected, it would be deeply problematic. It would be the October surprise. If Romney were to be elected, Romney would not appreciate coming into a situation in which there is a wartime battle and you can't face a new administration with immediate wartime situation until their own political apparatus, their people in state, their people in defense, their people in the National Security Council, and all of those people get in. What's the issue with Iraq? And some of you may know more about this. Let me tell you, I don't have answers. I have questions. 
and I want to tell you the questions, and only somebody who can answer those questions can give you a reasonable position on it. Questions are, one, does Israel have the capacity to um, significantly retard Iran's nuclear capacity? Does Israel and the United States together have the capacity to retard Iran's nuclear capacity? How well are sanctions working? We have the strongest sanctions we've ever had. They may or may not be strong enough, but one of the achievements of this administration has been to have the international standing to get sanctions. Are they working? Is targeted assassination working? And we clearly have targeted assassination. Furthermore, we also don't yet know if the type of um, computer viruses that have been introduced into this equation have had an impact and if the type of sabotage has an impact. If you begin with nuclear weapons and you're not sure about your detonators, you're not sure about what you have and how well you can trust it and control it, remember the word Three Mile Island and remember the fear of Three Mile Island and remember the word Chernobyl because one of the things that a nation faces <coughs> when it does that. I have a deeper problem as well, which is some of the very same forces that are telling us that we should go to battle with Iran are the same forces that told us that there would be no problem in going to battle with Iraq. And one of the things in that, it's the combination of the American intelligence and also the Israeli intelligence both of which were inaccurate in their predictions with regard to the response of Iraq. Last point on this, which is major and monumental. The reason we have the problem with Iran, is, and one could think of Iran in the following way, and we don't know the answer to that. Normally, in face of nuclear opposition, Mutually assured destruction is sufficient, but we do not know if the Iranians who believe in the next life are serious about believing in the next life. When Khrushchev and Kennedy faced off, you were certain that Khrushchev did not believe in the next life, and Kennedy seems to have been having a pretty good time of this life with no great incentive to end <coughs> his time of this life. Consequently, you came to a solution. The reason that we had the problem, we have the problem with Iran is also the weakening of Iraq because you would not have had the nuclear weaponization with the idea that you had a person next door and a power next door that could achieve balance. Last point whatsoever, which is the following. Israel is now in a strategic alliance with Saudi Arabia. And only someone who is unwise would not know how to transform a strategic alliance into a quasi-political benefit. And that's what I mean when you move from tactics to strategy, you know a little bit about what you want to achieve. And all of that 